Hi, my name is Derek Darkins. I'm a history teacher and my passion is for ancient and early medieval history. My aim is to make this accessible to the modern audience and to share my passion with you. Today's video is going to be about Pictish symbol stones. We're going to look today at who made them, we're going to look at when they were made, we're going to look at theories behind what they were for, and we're going to hopefully, by the end of this video, learn how to make one of your own. So what do we know about the Picts? They first appear in the historical record AD 297 in the words of the Romans, who describe the Picti, or the painted people who lived north of Hadrian's Wall on the island of Britain and terrorised the Roman frontier. This would have been what the Picts called themselves. It seems to have been a nickname applied to them by the Romans, but it seems to have stuck. They appear again in the historical record in the words of the Domnan, who was the abbot on Iona, um, who related a journey across the highlands to go and visit a Pictish king called Bridey up in Inverness in the 6th century AD. We also have accounts from the English historian Bede, during his ecclesiastical history of the English people, he relates the, the interactions between the Northumbrians and the Picts to their north, and then several clashes and wars the two different peoples had. The Picts themselves seem to have existed as a kind of nation state almost, from round about 400 AD through to the mid 9th century, when they absorbed themselves into the people of the West and became what we know as Alba or Scotland. So now we've learned a bit about the background of the Picts, let's now look at the purpose of the symbols and the stones that they're inscribed onto. Now historians divide up into four different ideas of what these things were for. The first one is as a boundary marker. Now if you take the symbol of your tribe and pick land and you inscribe it on a stone and you make the effort to do that, and you place it on the edge of your land, as a very, very visual, very scary symbol that this is your land and that foreigners should not come in here and trespass lest they bear the consequences. The second idea of what these symbols could mean is as a religious context. Class two stones had Christian symbols on the back, and it may be that back in the early medieval period, way before we had television or things like that, these carved stones were very visual links to the Bible and the story of Jesus and Christianity that these early priests were trying to spread. The stones themselves may have almost had supernatural powers uh, for the people that lived in the lands round about. Seeing the stone would have had a powerful religious context for them that stirred supernatural feelings in the people at the time. The third idea of what the stones were for is as a symbol of power and prestige. The cross stone which sat outside the palace at Rhiney would have been the main monument or icon that people would have seen as they entered into the palace gates. It would have been a striking symbol of the ruler's power. Look at what I've done, look at what I've erected on the landscape. This power, this stone, this symbol is me and everyone who see it should tremble. The fourth possible purpose of the stones is as burial or funerary monuments. One of the symbols, as we're going to see a bit later on, possibly represents the death or the passing of a king. Can you imagine, this is the Pictish people's version of erecting a pyramid or a Greek temple. This is them inscribing their message for generations to come. This will survive on the landscape for centuries. Look at me, I'm powerful. This is the mark I made. This is the people of Pictland leaving their mark for generations to come. So now we learned a bit about the purpose of stones. Let's think about where they would have appeared. Now today, Obviously, most of the symbols come down to us on stone because it's a medium that survives. It weathers, yes, but it survives through the centuries. It's thought, however, that these Pictish symbols were doing replete across Pictland during that time. They may have formed tattoos. Uh, it's thought that possibly the stones were created by bands of itinerant carvers who maintained a similar style across Pictland, travelling around Pictland and selling their services. Their own bodies may have been the blueprints for those Pictish stones that they carved so eloquently during their time. It's also thought that the picture symbols may have appeared in manuscripts and books. As far as we know to this day, no actual books survive from Pickland. They all seem to be lost or destroyed. It's likely, however, that they were being produced, and we found evidence at Port Mahomac up in Easter Ross to show that the picks were making manuscripts and books. It's likely that these symbols that were so common across all the stones across Pickland would have been in these books as well, in these leather pages. A third way that we may have found the stones would be on jewellery. You can see in the link below, silver jewellery still survives with Pictish symbols on it. And you can see an example of it in the National Museum of Scotland. The fourth medium, obviously, stone itself. The Picts tend to use a harder type of stone uh, to ensure that the symbols endure. However, it does appear on soft sandstones in places such as Weems, Caves and Fife. And that's where we're going to have a little look at later on in this video. So in terms of the symbols themselves, what might they be or what might we find? The symbols can be divided into two broad categories. The other come down as animals, which may represent the different tribes and clans within Pictland at that time. And they can be divided also into abstract symbols, 
that we're not entirely sure what some of those symbols may mean, and it's obviously open to suggestion from various different stories what any one could mean over another. In terms of the stones that they appear on, they're divided into three classes that's developed through time. Class 1 stones were produced from 400 to 600 AD, and the details on those stones were etched in and inscribed into the surface of an undressed stone, often very simple in their look. From 600 through to 800, we move into class two stones where the artistry moved forward massively and we start to see the detail coming forward in relief, which stands out from the surface of the stone. The shape of the stone as well has been very dressed and carefully formed. And on the back of the stone, we'll have a Christian symbol. Class three stones, the final iteration of the Pictish symbols, kind of come in from about maybe the, the 750s to the 800s onwards. And that's when the Pictish symbols are entirely dropped and we just have Christian iconography being produced on the stones, also in high relief, just as with the class two. So now having learned an awful lot about the background of Pictland, the symbols and the stones, let's have a go at making one for ourselves. I'm here at a local beach, not far away from where I live. Um, we're looking just now for a piece of flat sandstone that is going to take our symbol. I'm looking for one that's going to have a flattish surface between about A5 and A4 size uh, that we can lift and take back to the house with us to have a go at doing our symbol. Now, likewise, you may find a sandstone deposit near you or a place where you can find similar type of stone. Sandstone is the best one to work with because it's quite soft. Harder stones may be useful, but you might find it a little bit harder going. So, let's go and have a look and see what we can find. This type of surface is absolutely perfect in terms of like the size to put a symbol on. Brilliant. Only problem is lifting this thing to get it back to the car is going to be quite a challenge. So we're going to have a wee look now for something a wee bit smaller. Once again looking for this flat kind of surface that we can work with. And this type of size and surface is perfect for us. This stone here, have a go lifting it. Completely flat surface on the front, and it's an excellent size for us to put our symbol on. So we'll take this one away with us today. Okay, so we're just driving away from the beach now. We uh, managed to pick up five stones today. Um, there was a big sandstone deposit on the beach. It looked like some of the stone we found there may be discarded Victorian masonry from some of the old ruined buildings nearby, which is great because it gives us a flat surface to use. Go give them a clean. So, now that we've cleaned our stones off outside, it's time to get our tools out and to begin. So, let's see what kind of things we're going to need to do this. First of all, we've got some old lining paper, any old lining paper will do, to sketch out some ideas of designs of the symbols that we might try on our stone. You can see here, it's lining paper, and I've sketched out four different diagrams of what I might try for our stone today. After that, you're going to have your stone that you recovered from outside, and you can see, just to protect the table here, I've got it on sitting on an old towel, just so it doesn't move around and doesn't scratch the surface, which is really good for keeping it in place when you're working on the surface as well. After that as well, we're going to have some chisels. Now, I bought these on eBay, literally cost me about two or three pounds. It's great, straight and giant. Um, so I've got a metal tip, and this one's about five mil across. I've got a four mil one, and a three mil one for some of the smaller work that we're gonna be doing today. When I'm using those chisels, I'm just gonna use a normal hammer. You can pick up from any DIY store. You can obviously use yourself a mallet as well if you wanted. I'm gonna use some safety goggles when we start hammering. Sharpie pen to mark out my diagrams on my lining paper. Chop when we transfer a diagram over to the stone face. And lastly, I've got myself a wood screw wrapped in masking tape. Now this is going to be used to etch into the chalk design that we put on the face of the stone. The masking tape is to stop it digging into your uh, thumb and your fingers. Now I tried using a nail for this, but I found that the tip of the nail actually wasn't really sharp enough to make an etch into the stone. The wood screw has a far sharper point it's going to be a much more useful tool for us when we're doing this process. Okay, so let's start at the beginning. Okay, 
so here you can see I sketched out four designs of common Pictish symbols that occur across the stones. Um, each one of these is a good starting point for us to try from. Um, this one, as we talked about earlier on, uh, the serpent represents possibly one of the different kind of clans or tribes in Pictland. These broken rods, the Z rod, here and here, or the V rod, some historians think could represent a royal scepter. You can see the ends on either end there. Um, and the snapped uh, element of it may suggest that it represents the death of a king or the passing of a king. Um, so these may be from funerary monuments here. The Pictish beast up here um, is speculated by some to be mythical. Other historians have said it could perhaps represent the dolphins, which you can see in the Moray Firth. This could represent the fins of the dolphins coming out of the water. Other people have suggested it could be an elephant, judging by the, the big proboscis on the front over here. And obviously, few pics would have ever made it to Africa to see an elephant, so travelling by word of mouth, we end up with this kind of fantastical creature represented here. Right, so today we are going to have a go at doing the Pictish Beast. So my next stage is going to be to chalk that out onto the surface of our stone. <laughs> This is going to be obviously a very rough diagram uh, compared to this, um, but as we kind of like scratch it out with the screw, we'll wash this off and the design will come out much more clearly in the next kind of stage. So let's get a screw and begin etching. So as you etch in, it's okay to go over the bit you're etching several times. <laughs> this will be the line that you trace with the chisels uh, when you deepen the groove at the next stage. On the longer sections, try to make sure you get one continuous furrow as you etch into the stone. So, that's me finished the etching stage now. As you can see, a design is starting to take shape. The next stage is going to be to wash the front of the stone down to get rid of the chalk and bits of kind of dust and so on that we've accumulated to clarify the, the etching that we've made so far. After that, we're going to get our chisels out and then we're going to start deepening the design to make it really stand out. So, now on to this stage where we get into the chiselling. First things first, you need to be safe, get yourself some safety specs, hold it up. We use our hammer and we have our selection of chisels. Now, as I said before, I've got these from eBay, £3 for the set. I'm going to start off with the broadest blade one. This one's a 5mm tip, steel chisel, with a normal hammer that you can pick up from any kind of DIY store. Okay, you're going to find yourself one of the uh, grooves to start on. I'm going to start on the beast's belly. I'm going to set my chisel into the notch where you scratched in, just short of it. And then I'm going to chisel in. As you'll notice, that the chisel in, it's going to kick up some flex of stone. That's fine. You want little light taps each time. We're not going to hammer the stone in half. In fact, you want to be light. Other than that, you're likely, because the stone's quite soft, to have flakes of stone come up from the surface, which would kind of ruin your design. And so you can work your way along the line, chiseling in. And we want to make a trench that's round about three mils deep. As you go, keep blowing the dust out. And you can go back and tidy up any little bits of rubbish that are left in the
So as you can see, making your own picture symbol is a pretty easy thing to do, and it's fun as well. I'm going to link the different tools, the chisels and so on, that we use today in the description below, along with a list of all the tools and resources you'll need to have a go at doing your own picture symbol project. If you liked today's video, please give it a like, and thanks very much for watching.